الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كلامه المجيد والفرقان الحميد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قال لقمان لابنه وهو يعظه يا بني لا تشرك بالله صدق الله العظيم Respected brothers, elders, and sisters listening in, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in various ways. And the most important and the biggest of blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us with is the iman that He has blessed us with. And for this, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma laka alhamdu wa laka shum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ And الْإِيمَانُ يَزِيدُ وَيَنْقُسْ Iman is something that can go up, it can also come down. We thank Allah for our iman, for our belief, for the faith that he has given us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make us stronger in it. And amongst the benefit, uh, the bounties and the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us is the blessing of our family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with parents for those of us whose parents are still alive. Let's make the most of the time with them. For those that have passed away, Allah elevate their status, widen their graves, grant them entry into Jannah al-Firdaus. Along with the blessing and the bounty of our parents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with our children. Along with that, we also have our spouses, our wives, for the ladies, our husbands, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. Now, with regard to our wife or with regard to our husband, that's not a blood relation. It's a relation which has come to be through the nikah. The relationship with our parents is always going to be there, whether we like them or we don't. Whether we know of them or we don't know of them, we will still have that relationship with our parents, they are our biological parents, our DNA is in them and their DNA is in us. And likewise, we have our children who we will never leave. A person might divorce their wife, maybe they find a better wife. Not saying go divorce your wife if you find a better one because I'm pretty sure I'll get beaten up with baseball bats if I say that. But... If a person finds something better, finds problems in their marriage, the husband will divorce the wife, the wife will separate from the husband, and they can go their own way. But they will never separate from their children. There will always be the fact that these are my children, and I want to look after them, I want to be there for them, I want them to grow up to be like me or better than me. And in this way, they are a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is always connected to us. Now these children that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with, they come with their own blessings, they come with their own barakah, and they also come with their own challenges. And especially in today's day and age, when we have children who are growing up in the age of technology, the challenges are monumentous, huge, gigantic, much bigger than they ever were in the previous years. A hundred years ago, there was no internet. In fact, the internet is only around 30 years old, most younger than most of us here probably. 30 years, the internet has been around. hundred years ago, they didn't have the internet. Let alone the internet, they didn't have a phone. Maybe they had the landline phones that they were able to talk to each other. And even having that was for the rich and looked up upon. 200 years ago, they didn't even have cars. If you think about the year 1822, when 2022, 1822, they didn't even have cars at that time. For them to imagine of motorized transport or even flying in the sky was literally flying in the sky as if you're mad. How can a person even fly in the sky? It's not possible. So the challenges they had with bringing their children up with educating their children, with looking after their children, with preparing, for the, preparing them to be the leaders of the next generation, 
was much different than the challenges that we face today. In this day and age, our children know more than us by the age of three, four years old. They can probably use a smartphone better than us by the time they're five, six years old. They will, my daughter is two and a half years old and she opens up the exact app that she wants when she wants to without knowing that this is what it's supposed to do. Maybe she does know now. But that's the world that we're living in, where everything is so fast. In the last 10 years, you can see the advancements of technology, how things have changed so rapidly. And if we don't stay up to date with our children, then we have the very scary prospect of losing our children whilst they stay with us. And to illustrate that, I'll give you an example of a real world, a real world example, a real life one. Research was carried out with regard to the Muslims that migrated uh, from, uh, from Lebanon, if I'm not mistaken, to uh, South America, Latin America. Talk about Brazil and Argentina and that, that region. They had traveled there, migrated there over a hundred years ago. A researcher was carrying out research on how many of those people had remained on their faith, had remained on their deed. And the shocking truth was that almost 90% of the people that had migrated had left Islam. Allah. Had left Islam, and that's within a hundred years, 90%. And then she did research on her own family, which was living in North America. We're talking about Canada and America. And she says from her, she was the daughter of a, of a sheikh. She said from her own wider family, up to 60 people had left the fold of Islam. Allahu Akbar. I was reading today in America, 28% of the people who were Muslim, who were born Muslim, they don't no longer identify as Muslims. And all of this starts from a young age because there was no effort placed or little effort placed on the importance of deen, that the deen comes before anything else. I was reading a quote from one of the sheikhs. He said, if you educate and you prioritize and you teach your children about wealth and money and earning and job and all a house and all of this, then they will treat you as a commodity when you grow up. They will treat you like you are an asset. You're something to be placed in a home, pay some money every month to, for someone to take care of you, and that's it. Because there is no iman, deen, care, love, compassion left inside of that person. All they're thinking of is how to maximize their time and make more money. And that's why we look at the Quran for guidance that these children of ours who are growing up in the world of TikTok, in the world of Google, or shall we say Mufti Google, because it has the answer for everything. And you'd be surprised at how many children actually, when I say children, I'm talking about children 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, will go to the internet first to find things out before they will come to you as their parents, or they come to the Imam or the Sheikh or the teacher to ask for anything that they need. Because they find it easy. Because they think no one's gonna judge them. No one's gonna shout at them. No one's gonna tell them off. They will go to the internet and they will type on Reddit. They will put it onto TikTok. They'll put it onto Snapchat before they ask anyone else. And whatever people tell them there, they say, your parents must be very, very strict people. I wouldn't live with these kind of parents. And that's what's brewing up in their minds. We see children day in, day out, in order for parents to have an easier time, they will give them a tablet. Give them an iPad, give them a phone, maybe watch some cartoons, play some games. If the child's 15, 16 years old, they will have their own console maybe. And in these consoles, they are upstairs playing their game. You call them down for food, they will not come for food because they're busy playing. And that's, that's one aspect which is breaking the family fabric that the child is not taking part with the family. Family knows little about the child and the child knows little about the family because they don't ever sit together. So by the time the child wakes up, it's school time, father's already gone, mother's already doing this. 
Child goes to school, comes back, and upstairs into the gates. Come on, it's food time. They won't come. You go drop the food off in their room. They will eat by themselves. You pick the plates up. It's as if it's a hotel, bed and breakfast. And these are the children that are not only playing games. And I'll tell you this. My, I'm a computer science teacher myself, so I have a touch of some of this. That the games that they are playing have got chat functionalities within them. So they are talking to strangers around the world more than they're talking to you. And this is the actual reality of what is happening. If we are telling ourselves anything else, then we are ignorant or we are lying to ourselves. So this is the challenge that we face with our children. And what happened in South America that within a hundred years, they lost their Iman. Just imagine a hundred years is just one or one and a half, two generations, which means that Allah, Allah make it, may, may it not happen to us, may it not happen to our families, but our grandchildren will not be Muslim. Allahu Akbar. Our grandchildren will not be Muslim. How scary a thought, I will be in Jannah. I make dua every day, oh Allah, grant me Jannah to Firdaus. Jannah to A'la, you know the highest Jannah we want. But our grandchildren will not be in Jannah with us. How scary that thought is. Just the thought, how scary it is. So there is something that we have to do about this. The children that we have, we've got to do something. Sometimes we have uh, children, uh, parents, shall I say, parents who are extremely strict, super strict, nothing. They give the child nothing at all. They will stop them. They will shout at them, tell them off, punish them. And on the other hand, there will be some parents that will let everything go. Little bit slow, go, come on, it's fine, no problem. Everything is just let go. Give them whatever they want. We've got to be in the middle. Al Iman bain al Khawfi wa Raja. That the Iman is between hope and fear. We've got to have both. We've got to have a balance. Ihdin al Sirat al Mustaqim, the straight path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is neither leaning onto one extreme nor the other. One, uh, the, the, with regard to the punishment side of things, if we, can, if we constantly punish our children for doing something wrong, then we're also going to have issues such as there's the three R's of punishment. A child will either rebel or they will seek revenge in some way or another, or they will retreat. The three R's of punishment. They will rebel, revenge, or retreat. They will want to pull back from life and they'll just become quiet as if, you know, they're not there basically. Or if we punish them, they will become worse. They will try to do more. They'll try to say, I'll get you back another time. Or they will rebel and they just, uh, they, they will not listen to you at all. It's either this or we let them do anything they want and they will still go out of our hands. So we've got to find the middle way. The way in which we are able to keep our children with us. And at the same time, we are able to keep that uh, that, that uh, level of respect, that level of adab, that level in which the child knows that this is my father, this is my mother, yet they know that I can love them, I can talk to them, I am open with them. And for this, it requires an effort. And this is the effort where most of us fall short. We will try our best. We will try this, we will try that, but then we get tired. And then we give them the tablet, we give them the laptop, and we let them go. So we've got to start thinking. We've got to start thinking. The first thing we need to do is that we need to put in their hearts the love of the deen. When we put the love of the deen into the hearts of our children, they themselves will find a way to become better because we are guiding them onto the path. Give a man a fish, he will eat for a day. Teach a man how to fish and he will eat for a lifetime. We are teaching these children how to love the deen. When they end up loving the deen, the deen will guide them. But the first thing is we have to give them priority for the deen. And that's where we fall short, where we say Sunday school is enough. The masjid, we see very few, mashallah, this masjid, I'm actually surprised how many children come to the masjid, alhamdulillah, which is very good. And we've got to bring them to the masjid. How, will they, how else will they see the masjid? 
How else will they know this is where I'm supposed to go? We've got to bring him Luqman. The first thing he said to his son, لا تشرك بالله don't do shirk with Allah. Don't ascribe partners with Allah. He didn't tell him about family, about land, about uh, animals, about this, about inherit, nothing. The first thing he gave wasiya and he gave advice of was the deen. This is the most important thing. A person can work their entire life and live without the deen. There's no success in it. A person can be poor their entire life, live in a small hut, live a very tough life. But they have the deen with them. They are ultimately successful with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what we have to put within our children. And this will only come through us giving them the opportunity to study the deen on a regular basis. Not just to say Quran and that's it. As long as they know how to read the Quran or they finish one khatam, khalas, finish. Done. That's my responsibility. Done. I teach in a maktab and we see some parents are like that. They will send their child and say, come on, make him finish the Quran quickly. Because after that, they got school and they got this and they got that. Yes, they have all of those things. But the most important thing in the life of any Muslim is their deen. And if we do not educate our children with regard to the deen, we will lose them. And what happened in South America or what is happening in other parts of the world is going to happen here to next this year, actually, in March, the census will come out. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you that when the census comes out, the number of uh, people that don't associate themselves as Muslims would have dropped or shall we say increase. Don't associate as Muslims would increase. The people that have become atheists would increase also. Allah protect us. Allah protect our progeny. But this is the reality we are living in. And the only way that, alhamdulillah, so far we see the establishment of makatib and masajid across the country. You look in London, you've got hundreds, if not uh, maybe a thousand masajid and maktabs and musallas around. You look in Leicester, where we are from, and in Leicester, alhamdulillah, every other month, every two months, a musalla is popping up here and there. This is the effort of the shuyukh, of this ulama, of the people that are, that, that are, that, that are pushing for the fact that we must prepare for our next generation. Put in place something that will bring the children together towards their deen. Once it brings them towards their deen, once they learn to love their deen, they will then establish the next generation. But we've got to send as parents, it's our responsibility. Number one, as I said, to put the deen first. Once we put the deen first, then we will see that slowly but surely other things will fall in place. But then you might say, and shaitan might make you say that, but I don't pray myself. I don't go to the masjid for fajr myself. How am I going to make my child go to the masjid? Or I listen to music myself. How am I going to send my child to the madrasa? Or I smoke myself. How am I going to tell my child not to smoke? That's shaitan telling us. Once we put our children into the maktab and into madrasa, they might become the means of our hidayat. I'll tell you a very simple example, a story, actual reality, that one of the, uh, my father-in-law, in fact, next door to his shop, he had, uh, this is in uh, Gloucester, he had uh, a, a restaurant where a brother, Muslim brother, who was selling alcohol. Uh, so he advised him nicely, gently, you know, he said to him, It'd be better if you didn't sell alcohol because, you know, etc. So he advised him of that and the brother listened, but he said, you know, this is, I have to, etc. He left it and he continued selling it. He had admitted his children to the maktab and the children would attend maktab uh, regularly. And one day in some sort of conversation, he might have come up where the, where the teacher also mentioned something of the similar aspect that, you know, alcohol is haram for the Muslims. We shouldn't even touch the alcohol. We shouldn't even go close to it. We shouldn't even sell it. So he mentioned all of this to the students. The children came home to their father and they said, uh, you know, I don't, uh, you know, how can we sell alcohol? Imam Saab said that we shouldn't, you know, as Muslims, this is wrong. And the father said to, to my father-in-law, he said, something hit me. He said, when my child told me the same thing you had told me, it hit me differently. And I not only stopped selling alcohol, I closed the shop and I started working elsewhere. 
He closed his shop completely and he started, instead of running the business, he started working somewhere else. So instead of earning haram or taking money from something haram, he decided, but I don't want to. And why? Why did he do this? Because his children, they were going to the maktab, they were studying the deen, they told their father that, you know, it's not, it's not good. And that hit him differently because his children are telling him. So the children became the means of this man's hit. And that is the importance. I can be doing wrong things, doesn't matter. Yes, on the day of Qiyamah, I will be questioned about myself. Maybe I will also be questioned about my children for what I did for them, how I prepared them, how I gave them the opportunities that they have. At the end of the day, they will also have their own questions to answer. Do I want my family to go into Jahannam because I didn't give them the opportunity? No, most definitely not. I don't want to be the one that is the last Muslim in my generation. Neither do I want to be the one whose children or grandchildren are not going to be Muslim. So in order to stop this chain and to slow this process, and in order to ensure the entry of our generation, our progeny, our children and their children, their entry into Jannah, the most important thing is give them access to deen. Make them come to the masjid. And I heard, mashallah, you had the Fajr nights here in Ramadan. How an amazing concept to bring the children to the masjid at the time of Fajr, the time of Barakah, when the angels are listening to the recitation of the Quran, when we hear the birds chirping, how beautiful, I'm, I'm sure many of you who walk here, you know the feeling at Fajr is just different. Make our children experience this feeling. Why should we be selfish in this matter? We've got to take the children seriously. We've got to ensure that we prepare for our own akhirah as well as the akhirah of our children. And we've got to make sure that we know what we need to do for our children. And for that, I've given you just one point, attach them to the deen. But there are so many more ways. Make yourself a role model, look after them in terms of their health, in terms of their, give them love. There's the pastoral side of it. There's the mental health and well-being side of it. There's so many different angles which you can, uh, you can inshallah find out about from your imams. But if you give, if you give the deen its importance, the children will automatically want to give it importance too. So we've got to take that inshallah today. Make sure that we know what our children are doing. The technology that we've given our children, the phone, if we've given it to our children, make sure that you give it on a control basis. We see again and again, students come to our class sleepy, tired. Why? Because at night till 2, 3 a.m. they are watching YouTube. They are doing that with their parents in the house. They are sitting there on their uh, Snapchat, swipe, 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 swipe. Keep checking. Instagram, swipe and have a look at what people are putting on their stories. For us, it sounds, you know, why would they spend so much? But that's literally, there is, you know, when they say that uh, when a product is free, when a product is free, then you are the product. So Facebook is free. Instagram is free. YouTube is free. You don't have to pay money for it. The reason for that is because you are the product. You are making them money. And that's why they're going to keep you for longer. There is an entire science based on how to keep your attention longer, how to keep you glued. And I'm sure you've experienced your adults as adults. We sit on YouTube and we will not finish until it's one hour, two hours past because they, they, they make you stay watching whatever you're doing there because that makes them money, the, adver the advertisement, all of this. Stuff. So we've got to put limits on our children, healthy limits. Allow them what they need to check, read, look at, learn from, etc. But place some healthy limits on our children. In their bedroom, no phone should be allowed. No, no, no laptop should be allowed. Or after 10 o'clock, after 11 o'clock, when this time is to go to sleep, then all of that comes outside, put it onto a table, a desk, where everyone knows that this is it, you put it here. It's going to be difficult. It's not an easy task to do. And I'm not going to say that... Uh, 
if your child has been having their own phone in their own room or their own laptop or their own computer in their own room, they're going to give it up so quickly. It's going to be difficult, but once you do it, you will see the benefits yourself. You will see the benefits of putting this limitation on them. Healthy limitation. We don't say completely gone, finished. We're not going to use it anymore because that's just irresponsible, really. They're going to use, they're going to grow up in this world. They're going to know how to use these things. So we've got to put healthy limits on them. Know what they're doing. Talk to them. You'll be surprised at how many parents don't know what their child does. You don't know what your child got in the school, what the grade was in the madrasa. They come home, they eat, your son's name is Muhammad, and that's all you know about him. What's, what subject, what GCSE subject did you take? But your son, what grade did he get? What's he going to become? He's going to become doctor. That's what we know. He's going to become engineer. He's going to become a lawyer. That's the only thing we know. Anything else? Progress, behavior. Unless the teacher calls us and says, your son's posing a problem here. We don't know much. We've got to make it our business to know. Once we know more about our child, we can do more about our child. We can help them. I'll, I'll end, inshallah, with one, just one incident. And uh, this is a very sad one. In, 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 uh, just to let you know about how much it could cost you to let go. The, the, the parenting style of just letting go. Uh, you know, there's, there's online forums. Uh, and one of them is called ex-Muslim. Ex-Muslim forums. So people that were Muslim before, unfortunately, for some reason or another, they left the fold of Islam. And research says that most of the time when they leave Islam, it's due to pastoral issues. The, uh, there was no one that they could turn to. There was no one that could look after them, to listen to. Everyone that they talked to, they just shouted them down, put them down, blamed them, etc. And that's the reason why they would say, oh, Islam is the problem, I'm leaving Islam. So one of the stories on the very sad, there was a girl who was writing this, obviously they write anonymously, so we don't know much more than that. But she says, I wear the hijab. She says, I perform my salah. And as a family, we wake up every day at night. Every night we wake up as a family, we perform tahajjud salah. But she says at the end of this, she says, I don't believe in any of this. She says, I'm not a Muslim. The only reason why I do this is just to be good with my family. I don't want to cause any problem in my family, but I don't believe in any of this. Now, can you imagine? Just think of it being your child. Your child is coming there, sitting with you, eating with you. You take him to the masjid, he comes to the masjid with you. You take him for a program, he goes program with you. Or you send her to the maktab and she goes maktab. But inside her mind and her heart, she's keeping something which she is completely out of Islam. But she's not able to tell you. She doesn't want to tell you. She doesn't want to speak to anyone. Any questions she have, any issues she has, she doesn't want to mention it. How would you feel? You'd feel broken. You'd feel lost. You'd feel, what did I do to deserve this? But the reason why they don't speak is because we don't give them the opportunity. We don't give them the time. We don't sit with them and say, you know, how are you doing? How's your school going? How's your madrasa going? You know, what's, you know, when they come back from their friends, what did you do? Not as if, what did you do? Did you get up to this? Not, not, not in a manner to check, but in a manner to say, you know, how did you get along? What did you do? And that way they know they can speak to you. When they know they can speak to you, they know that they can bring their issues to you. If a question like this does arise in their mind, why am I Muslim? How do we know Islam is the real religion? They will, first thing they will do is probably go to the internet and type that question in. And on the internet, as we know, Mufti Google has answers for everything and everyone posts everything. So they will read this, they will read this, they will read this, they will read this, they'll make sense. Tiga, I'll listen to this, I'll follow this. And slowly but surely, it builds up. Point being, we've got to be alert. We've got to be there for our children. In this world that we're living in, it's more challenging than we can think of and we can fathom. But at the very least, the, the smallest thing that we can do, number one, is to connect them to the deen. To show them that the deen is about love, is about affection, is about care, it's about compassion. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ If you were hard-hearted and harsh, then they would have all gone away from you, the Sahaba. If we become hard-hearted and harsh with our children, with our, uh, with our youngsters, don't let them into the masjid. When they come to the madrasa, we shout at them, tell them off. 
then they will all go away. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Al-Mu'minu ma'laf. In Musnad Ahmad, Al-Mu'minu ma'laf. A mu'min is a treasure of love. We are full of love, compassion and kindness and care. So we've got to then show that to our children, bring them closer to the deen. When we bring them closer to the deen, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put that love of the deen in their hearts, which they will then transfer to others. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us towards looking after our children in the best manner possible. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us in order to ensure that our children remain on the deen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our iman, to protect the, uh, the iman of our children, to protect the iman of the progeny of, uh, of, 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 of our progeny, of our community, and to allow us and all of them to leave this world with the kalima, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Ameen wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك الشكر كله وإليك يرجع الأمر كله اللهم لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما والحمد لله على كل حال اللهم إنا نعوذ بعزتك من سخطك وبمعافاتك من عقوبتك ونعوذ بك منك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك ربنا أتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وصلى الله تعالى على النبي الأمي وعلى آله وبارك وسلم تسليما We have come just to finish off I think uh, the collection has happened I'm sure the announcement you've heard as well at the Darul Ulum Alhamdulillah the children do come for, they've come from the from this community as well. And what we tried to do is, right when the Laulum was established, 1993, at that time, hitting and beating was usual. People used to do that. But since then, when our founder, Malana Ismail Sahib, was here for Isha, he had this policy of never to hit any child. Never. No teacher was allowed. Even though it was rampant, a lot of people used to do it in other places. But in the Darul Ulum, never. Since the initiation, 1993, until today, hitting has not been allowed. And the whole thing is about teaching our children with love, with compassion, with care. Now, alhamdulillah, children from there graduate uh, with their GCSEs. They graduate with A-levels. At the same time, they do the Tahfiz al-Quran. At the same time, they can, they can then move on to the Alimiya course. They also finish with Qira'a. And they also finish sometimes as qualified teachers. So last year or year before, uh, some of the graduates who actually completed the Alimiya course, they did the Hifz. At about 22, 23, they left. So they had done the Hivs, they were Hafid. They had done the Alimiya course. They had the GCSEs. They did A-levels and they qualified as a qualified teacher who can go into any state school and teach. All of that from the Darul They start from the age of 11 years old, year seven. And Alhamdulillah, the uh, oldest student now is I think 20 or 22, 23. So they will go through with all of this, all provided within the Darul Ulum. Alhamdulillah, Darul has got a building next door, which is why we've come from Leicester. Uh, whatever you can support with, that's much appreciated as the project is uh, 31st of January is when it needs to be paid off. So if you are able to donate any amount, uh, it will be much appreciated. We have almost 200,000 still left to raise. Uh, it is Allah's project. We don't do this work. Only Allah makes it happen. How it's going to get to completion on the th by the 31st January, Allah knows. But this is our opportunity, or shall I say your opportunity whilst we are here, for you to take part in it. For you to take uh, a step in assisting this Darul Ulum in order to become a beacon of light and continue its services for the community of the UK and, the benef and benefit the people of the world, inshallah. So whatever you can donate, we have, I bought the card machine, inshallah, I'll send for you. And uh, if you can donate uh, via the website, that will also be much appreciated. Allah grant you barakah, look after you and your families. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us. Jazakumullah khairah, subhanallah, alhamdi. Subhanakallah, alhamdi. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah,
I want to be